But let me submit to you, one of the great questions that we read in the Bible comes in the early part of the Bible, in the second book of the Bible. It's Exodus chapter 5. Early in that chapter, about verse 2, the leader of the Egyptian people, the Pharaoh of those days, who uh, was holding the, the children of Israel in Egyptian bondage, when Moses came to him, the Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? And let the people go. Who is the Lord? That's a fascinating question. It's a question that I believe that is a very relevant question for us today. It obviously was a question that should have been asked in those days, but it's a question that needs to be asked today. Who is the Lord? I think the answer to that question will really determine a lot. It will determine how people live. You know, we step back and we look at our world today and we see people that are confused. We see people that are sin sick. And we're frankly sick of seeing such sin sickness in our world today. It bothers us. It concerns us. And we don't know what tomorrow holds. As the song just a moment ago um, reminded us, but we do know who holds tomorrow. And that's the comforting thing. But how we answer this question, though, really determines how we're going to live. And it's a question that other people need to consider and need to have the right answer to so they can determine how they should live. I believe that God absolutely wants us to know that He exists and that He is the one who makes life possible and who uh, dictates how life should be lived. And the reason that I know that is because it's important for me to know God. The question really is, can we know God? Is there sufficient information to understand who God is? And I believe the scripture that's on the screen answers that question. For this verse reminds us that God will punish those who do not know Him. It also says those who do not obey the gospel. But we're going to focus on the ones who do not know Him. If the Bible says, if God says, that He will punish those who do not know Him, then is it possible then for us to know God? And I submit to you because God is a God of of fairness and justice, that He would never expect people to, uh, He would never allow people to be punished for not knowing Him if it were not possible for people to know Him. And so based on Paul's affirmation here in 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 8, we can know who God is. The Bible even says, he who comes to God must believe that he is. So yes, it is possible to know God. If it's true that we can know God, if it's true that we can seek him, as Hebrews 11 and verse 6 reminds us, then how is that possible and where is that possible? Well, I submit to you that the answer is found in the Bible. The question and the answer is found right there in the Bible. Isaiah said, seek the Lord while he may be found. Isaiah chapter uh, 55 and verse 6. And then the Bible, of course, explains where we find God, where we seek him. We seek for him in the pages of his word. The Bible is the only revelation we have from God that is about God. It is God's message for us today. Someone has said that the Bible contains the mind of God. And so in order to really know someone, you need to know how they think. You really can't know someone intimately unless you know how they think. And the Bible contains the mind of God. It obviously does not contain the entire mind of God. Uh, No book could ever contain all the wisdom that God has. But it contains what God wants us to know about Him. And so as Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey His voice? We ask that question today. And we really will not obey God. We'll not live for God. We'll not figure out our place in this world. We'll not be able to help other people figure out their place in the world unless we know who God is. And so here's what I propose to you for today. And for the next three Sundays, including today, I propose that we try to answer this question. Who is God? It is a a basic, fundamental discussion that really will determine 
the type of relationship that not only we, but this world will have with God. Until we answer this question and answer it appropriately, we can't expect people to believe in God. We can't expect people to be willing to change their lives, as we would say, to repent of sin. Uh, we can't expect people to become Christians like the Bible tells us to become Christians. We can't expect people to worship like the Bible tells us to worship. We can't expect people to live like the Bible tells us to live until we come to know God. So I propose we answer this question. And this morning, if you're looking at your outline, you'll see there are four things that we want to uh, spend some time considering this morning as we ask this question, who is God? The first answer that we're going to give to this question, who is God, is He is the sustaining one. In the fourth word of the Bible, we're introduced to God. In the beginning, God. There He is. And so what God wants us to know is that He was there. He wants us to know He was not only there, but He is responsible for everything that happened there. And so it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Perhaps it's been pointed out to you that you find the five fundamental facts of science right there in the very first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, time, God, force, created, action, the heavens, space, and the earth matter. Right there it is. God knew what he was doing. And he revealed a lot to us uh, in that very verse in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. Uh, according to John the Revelator, he created all things, Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11. And it also says, uh, and by his will they exist. It is according to the Hebrew writer, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 3. But I want you to not only understand that God is the creator, but per this point, he is the sustainer. God is the sustainer of this world. In Hebrews 1 and verse 3, it says he is upholding all things by the word of his power. This world is sustained by God. Remember, Revelation 4 and verse 11 says all things were created by him and it's by his will that they exist. And it was according to Paul in that great sermon at Athens in Acts chapter 17 that he said that it's in God, it's in Him that we live and that we move and we have our being. So God is the sustaining one. And I would remind you that everything you have, as James would say, every good and every perfect gift comes from God. God is the sustaining one. The next Answer is, God is the everlasting one. When you think about who God is, you've got to remember He is the everlasting one. Now, God made us incredible beings. But He also made us to only be able to understand certain things. And I don't know about you, but one of the difficult things to comprehend about God is to comprehend that He says He made us in the beginning from dirt. Have you ever really thought about that? Uh, we sing a song, How Great Thou Art. And in that song it says, From dust our God created man. I remember when I was um, pretty young, first time I really paid attention to those words. And it, and it just, um, it's one of those difficult things to comprehend. That God was able to take some dirt and make a man. I heard the story about this um, little boy. He'd been studying in Bible class how God had created the world. And the teacher told them that, that from the uh, dust that God created uh, man. And the uh, next week or so, uh, this little boy went to a funeral with his mom and dad. And he heard the preacher stand up at the funeral and say about the one that had deceased. He said, uh, he came from the dust and he's going back to the dust. And on the way home, this little boy told his mom, you better look under my bed because someone's either coming or somebody's either going. <laughs> it's one of those hard things for us to comprehend. It really is that God was able to do that. But something that takes it even further, something that's even more difficult to comprehend, is that God is an everlasting being. 
what does that mean? What does that mean to you? What that means in a practical sense is you can't go far enough back in time to find when he did not exist. And in a, in a practical way, if we had the ability to do so, you could not go far enough into the future at any point into the future and find a time when God does not exist. And so this is what the Bible says about it. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 90 and verse 2, he is from everlasting to everlasting. Now, in my mind, I, I have no ability to think into the future beyond what I'm probably going to have for lunch today. That's about as far ahead as I can go. But I can go back in time. I can go back in time for the amount of time that I've lived here in this world. And then I can go back in time uh, by listening and considering things that my parents tell me happened in their lives, in my grandparents' lives. And then I can read in history books about this country. And I can read in history books about other countries um, coming into power, rising and falling. I can go back far enough in time to where I can read about things that took place in the life of our Lord. And I read about them in Scripture. I can go back far enough in time to I can read about the chosen, those of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I can go far enough back in time. Even reading these events in, from the Word of God, where God created this world. That's about as far as any of us can go back in time and have something to associate with that time. But see, what the Bible teaches us is that God goes back further in time than that. If there's some way in the world you can imagine the day before the world began, God was there. And if you can just somehow in your mind imagine a year before the day that God created the world, God was there. If you could go back, let's say, another 10 years, or another 20 years, or another 50, or 100, or 1,000, or a million, or a billion, God's always been there. Because the Bible says that He is from everlasting to everlasting. It also says in Revelation 1 and verse 8, He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. It says He is and was and that which is to come. In other words, there is no way to measure the everlastingness of God. It goes back in the past as far as you can go. It will go into the future as far as you could go. That is an amazing fact to try to comprehend. And yet there's a reason this information is in the Word of God. He is the everlasting one. Then as we continue to answer that question, uh, we'll come to this. Who is God? He is the self-existing one. Uh, here's another one of those deep thoughts. If you just want to kind of stay in that deep thought mood for just a moment. Another deep concept is the self-existence of God. If God has lived forever, as we suggested just a moment ago, the natural question is how? How has he lived forever? And there is an answer to that question found in John chapter 5 and verse 26. It says, the Father has life in Himself. This just simply means that He is a self-existing being. When God called Moses to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt, this is, of course, before Moses went into Pharaoh and told him to let the people go. And Pharaoh asked that question, well, who is the Lord that I should let the people go? When, when God first went to Moses and said, I want you to go do that, Moses had a, a pretty decent question in response to God. He said, well, you know, who am I going to tell him sent me? And, and this is the answer that God told Moses. He said, I am that I am. Well, I'm sure that made a lot of sense to Moses like it makes a lot of sense to us. I am that I am. What did God mean by that? God's answer was to tell them, I am hath sent you. Exodus chapter thir uh, 3 and verse 14. But what does that mean? Well, depending on which translation you're using, if you have an American Standard Version, you might see a marginal rendering that says, I am because I am. Or perhaps if you're reading from the Revised Standard or the New King James, the NIV or the ESV, it says, I am who I am. But what does that mean? Or perhaps the Septuagint, the Greek 
translation of the Hebrew captures it the best for us when it says, I am the being. I am the being. Moses said, who should I tell them sent me? And God says, you tell them that the being sent you. In other words, God exists and has always existed. He has life in himself. And, and everything that exists, exists because he allows it to exist. He is the one that has given life. Nothing would exist without him. So he is not dependent on any other person or any other being. He's dependent on no one. He's the self-existing one. That means that we are dependent totally on him. And then the, the fourth answer that we should consider, who is God? He is the omnipresent one. We live in a busy society. And this is another one of those perhaps deep concepts about God. But we live in a busy society where we uh, get spread pretty thin. And sometimes we, we think, sometimes we wish, sometimes we even say, you know, if I could only be in two places at one time. Well, here's one of those great things about God. God can be in two places at one time. Uh, as a matter of fact, He can be in every place at one time. God can and will be and continue to be everywhere. When Solomon was commissioned to build the temple, in 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 2, he um, is communicating with Hiram, the king of Tyre. And he's asking for help in building the temple. He's asking for a, a master architect of sorts to build the temple. But he, he makes a statement, though, in this communication with the king of Tyre. In 2 Chronicles chapter 2 and verse 6, Solomon just has one of those moments. When he has one of those times where he has a deep thought, if you will. And in the middle of this communication about the task of building the temple, he says, but who am I? Who am I that I should build him a temple? Since heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain him. Think about that for just a moment. Solomon was right. Solomon understood you, you can't put God in just one place. And so someone has said, God is the circle, the center of which is everywhere, and the circumference of which is nowhere. That's because you cannot contain God. That, that word in the Hebrew, it means you can't measure God. It means you can't calculate God. It's because He's everywhere. Psalm chapter 139 is one of those great chapters from the Word of God. And there's a ton of information contained in it. The first part of the chapter, it explains that God understands us. He knows how we think. He knows our thoughts. Uh, toward the end of the chapter, it explains that He created us. Uh, how It's even said, for you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. But here in the middle of this, um, in chapter 139 of Psalms, beginning in verse 7, it reveals something about this God who knows us and create, created us. It says, beginning in verse 7, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to the heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning, and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. Even there your hand shall lead me. When the writer here says, if I go up, as we would think, into the heavens, you're there. If I go down to the deepest parts, even to hell, as we would say, you're there. If I take to the wings of the morning, in other words, if I go to the east where the sun rises, you're going to be there. And then he says, if... if if I dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea to the one in Palestine that would have been out into the, the west the Mediterranean if I go to the north if I go to the south if I go as high or if I go as low if I go as far this way or as I go as far that way as I can go you're there 
you're there. And even there, he says, your hand shall lead me, your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall light uh, about, uh, about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, and the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. There is not one place where God does not exist because he is the omnipresent one. What we've seen in answering this question, just touching the hem of the garment in answering this question, who is God? He's the creator and he's the sustaining one. He is the everlasting one. He is the self-existing one and he is the omnipresent one. You say, but what does that mean? I mean what does that mean to me? And, and as we take it a step further, what does that mean to everybody else? Well, if you want to take another couple of notes and just out beside these points on your outline, when we say that God is the sustaining one, it means that he is under you. God is your support. He is the reason you exist. He is, he is your platform. He is your base. He is the sustaining one. You, you live right now because he created you. And then when we talk about how he is the everlasting one, that means that he is before you and he is bef- behind you. In, in the sustaining one, he is under you. In the everlasting one, he is before you and he will come after you. So, in other words, before you ever existed, he was there. And after you leave this world, he'll still be there. He's the everlasting one. And then he is the self-existing one in that he is over me. He is great in that nobody gives him life. He gives life to himself. And this is a a, a reminder about the um, sovereignty of God. God is the self-existing, sovereign force in this world and in all the universe and everything that is. He is the self-existing one. He is ruler. He is supreme. He is king. And because he is below me, and because he is before me, and he's after me, and because he is over me, I better listen to what he has to say. I better acknowledge his presence and his will for my life. And then being the omnipresent one, he is also in me. When we think about God, we we try to imagine where could he be? We know he's everywhere. But see, we're reminded in scripture that he he is right here with me. He is with me. He's even in me. His spirit as a Christian lives within us. And so the answer to this question means everything. I mean, it's the most basic question that one can consider, but the the answers and the implications are about as deep as one can consider. And I hope today, as you consider who God is, I hope that he is really the one that you acknowledge that is under you. I hope that you acknowledge that he is before you and he's after you. I hope that you acknowledge that he is over you and that you should answer to him. You should live for him. You should change for him. You should even die for him. And I hope you acknowledge, if you are living for him, that he is with you. And he will be there for you, help you, protect you. I hope who God is makes a difference in your life. And if it hasn't made a difference yet in your life, today's the day to start letting it make a difference. It may be that you need to respond and and come into a a first relationship with Him. He he created you. and He's your Father in the sense that He created you, but He wants to be your spiritual Father. He wants you to be His child. And that can only occur when you are baptized into Him and, and you become His child and He becomes your Father. Maybe that you need to obey the gospel today. Remember that verse, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 8? The Lord's going to come and take vengeance on those who do not know him 
and on those who do not obey the gospel. Have you obeyed the gospel? It's about, that, that means to become a Christian like the Bible says to become a Christian. That's what that means. Are you a Christian like the Bible says to become a Christian? And if you are, and yet God hasn't been reigning over your life, you haven't been living for him the way he instructs for you to live for him, do you need to come and make some changes? Uh, do you need to come and confess that you've been a sinner and ask for the church to pray with you and for you and to encourage you? That's why we're here. That's why we offer this invitation. Do you need to come and make the Lord God king of your life, the Lord Jesus the savior of your, of your life, forgive, forgiver of your sins? And if you need to come and ask for his forgiveness once again because you haven't lived up to his high and holy name, why don't you come right now as we stand and as we sing?